Why grip is so important, guys. Um, I tell people grip is your first sight picture. Well, that sounds really weird, right? Do you guys know what sight picture is? Okay, so grip is our first sight picture. And why I say that is, um, like, my finger, thankfully, has been attached to me my entire life, okay? So I have a really good ability, especially if something's close, to kind of just point at things and know that I'm generally pointing, like you, 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 right? I can do that easily. And same way we throw a ball, right? We can just, it's kind of this, like, weird ability we have to index something and aim at it. So a lot of people will call that point shooting, right? When you hear about that in guns, it's like point shooting. Eh, sure, but where does that come from? That's the biggest thing I never saw answered when people say point shooting. And I'm like, that's like weird just shooting without your sights, okay? And so as I started thinking about it, I went, you watch a lot of body cam footage of police officers using their gun, and you're like, he ain't looking at his sights. There's no freaking way. Like, the guy's right here, and he's like, ah, you know, doing that. And you're like, he's not looking. There's no front sight to that dude until maybe the third, fourth, fifth round or something like that. So... But it got me to thinking is like, what is he using as a sight picture? What is he using as a method to sight the gun? His grip, like, right? He's getting that consistent grip and it basically allows you to not optically overload yourself. So you think about stress, right? Let's paint a scenario for you. All right, I'm this far from you guys and I've got a knife, I'm coming at you, right? And you're going to draw your gun. You go to draw your gun and you either shoot iron sights or a dot, right? How many of you think you're going to wait <laughs> to press a shot if I'm this far from you? to see a front sight or to see a red dot? No, I don't care if you, I don't know how much training, whatever, like you're not gonna wait because that person is so close, you're just gonna use your index with that gun, your grip to be like, yep, look in center of his chest and fire. Now, three or so rounds in, if you have good fundamentals and you know maybe first, second round, you're gonna start picking up some like sight picture, right? You're gonna start being like, ooh, I think I saw my red dot low left on him, so I need to shift high right or whatever. You know, you're gonna start to bring that data in. But a lot of people, when we train on a flat range right like this, they will wait to see their, their sights or their dot, right? But the reality is they're probably gonna be there. Their grip, if it's good enough, is gonna put them in that, that acceptable sight picture range. Um, there's a couple drills we're gonna do today to practice this for you guys to where you'll see you're, you, it relaxes you optically to not have to look for so much. It gets you shooting on the target a lot sooner, um, which is practical. And then it kind of makes you get that like little bit of warm and fuzzy where we're so used to just shooting based off of where our sights are, our iron sight or our red dot. It starts to give you this like more functional shooting that you would do if you get, have any of you guys ever done force on force at all? With, okay, so when you do force on force, most people don't, like when it's close, they're, they're not processing a sight. They're just aiming out and shooting, right? Um, you will see the people that shoot a lot and have good grips and, and are, they will be accurate. The folks that are newer and don't have good grips, they'll shoot low, they'll shoot them in the hands, they'll start throwing rounds. So it's really, really important that that first index of when you present the gun, that it goes where you're looking. We kind of call that with handguns, natural point of aim or perceived point of aim. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's kind of the, the concept of why grip is important, right? It's our first sight picture, okay? So now we're gonna talk about, well, that's great, but how? How do I get that grip? What does that look like? Um, so guys, what we're gonna do um, with our right hand, okay? I'm gonna kinda, I assume most of you guys, if you've been shooting for a little while, you understand the just of how to grip a pistol. What I'm gonna do here is just kinda break down the, the whys and, and what makes you know this helpful, and then we'll kinda let you guys try it out and I'll make little adjustments. All right, so with this right hand, I don't want to be too off center because if you look, right, I have this mushy soft part where this pistol kind of fits perfectly in my hand, right? Um, when we get a handshake, that's the same way that a good handshake feels. Like if you ever gotten one of those like where someone latches down too soon onto you and you're like, oh God, that's awful. Um, we want to get nice and high up in here. We don't want to have a bunch of space between the gun. Does that make sense? Um, and we want to get nice and high up under there. That's nothing revolutionary. People have been teaching that for a really long time, but it's good to know. Um, part of the reason we want it in that mushy part is think about it. If I have bone that it's hitting on this left side, what's that going to do to my muzzle and recoil? It's going to probably make it hit resistance on this side and not fall equally, like evenly back up and down. Does that make sense? So we want to have that like nice, good pocket for that recoil to retreat into, right? And additionally, we also want to make sure we're not being lazy with these fingers. We want to like kind of take the slack out because if we're being too lazy, then not only do we have a trigger pull, but then we have to like pull the gun into that pocket of our hand. So we want to use these, these fingers enough to where it's in that pocket of the hand so that the gun's not going to retreat into that pocket while I'm trying to pull the trigger. Does that make sense? That one's a little bit more complex to explain, but um, we just want to make sure that it's like firmly seated in there. Now, these fingers, they do not need to be crushing the gun. 
right? Um, if the more we tense up with this hand, the more that we induce like all sorts of ligaments and stuff to start pressing and doing weird stuff. So really we want this hand just about the firmness you'd hold a bike, you know, the handlebar of a bike. You're not like sitting there gripping the crap out of it, but you're kind of just holding on to it, right? Um, okay, so that's basically what this hand should look like, all right? This hand, I know we call it our dominant hand. It's kind of not. Like besides with manipulations and stuff and reloads, sure. But when we're shooting, actually this left hand, if we can, tends to kind of be the more dominant hand. Um, like I tell people, there's like kind of a, a thought process of crush with this hand and relax with this hand. That doesn't really work for me. Kind of weird, like if I try and do that, it weirds me out. I've been gripping such a long time the way that I do. But what does help is I think about aiming with this left hand and all of a sudden this hand becomes more dominant for me. Um, and it helps me generate better recoil control, okay? So what I'm doing with this, this palm right here is I'm trying to put this palm right in this spot. The primary thing is that this palm is what's doing a lot of the work. Okay, so this palm landing in there, then these fingertips roll in and they create pressure. What a lot of people do is they roll these fingertips in and then roll that palm in. And what that can start to do is create a gap on the back here and that's really not what you want. Does that make sense? Does, yes, so you wanna set that palm and then roll these fingertips around and that will generate that pressure that you want on the gun for 360 degrees. Does that make sense? Does this generally look how everyone holds the gun or is anyone doing something completely different? My thumb isn't as straight. I don't yeah, so this thumb, the other one. oh, this one, so you're kind of curling more up. up. Okay, so what that's probably coming from is this hand being too low. And so that's a great, I'm glad you mentioned that. So the reason that what dictates this angle, right, of my, my thumb is actually matching the angle of the grip with these fingers. So if I start to have my thumb too far straight up, uh -huh. right, you see this angle of the grip, now all of a sudden I'm pulling away from that. Think about what that's doing to the mechanics of the gun. Now I'm trying to use muscle to fill in this area versus matching the angle of that grip, laying those fingers in, and now I have equal support on the actual frame of the firearm. Does that make sense? So now that's gonna, that, that recoil is gonna be hitting an equal wall versus if it's rolled out like this, now I have to flex my pinky and try and get down there. Um, and it kind of just makes recoil control not as passive, okay? There's a lot of people that have weird grips and can control recoil because there's not a whole lot of recoil. Um, what we want is passive recoil control, right? We don't want to overuse energy and we don't want to underuse energy. Make sense? Um, so to tweak that a little bit today, I'll kind of, I mean, there's a window. You don't, some people will be like way the heck up here and that creates a pocket back here where they're missing as well. Yeah. So you don't want to be too far rolled way the heck forward. You also don't want to be like, some people will be up like this. That's unnecessary. You're put, that's putting too much energy into a tiny little pistol. And when you start moving and shooting, which is like concealed carry like I don't see too many concealed carry videos I mean they happen but like movement is almost always part of you know drawing a concealed carry and shooting right so for me I just bring that gun up to my eye line I don't try and do any like turtle stuff it's just bring the gun up to my eye line um, and that way it allows me to move and, and be comfortable whereas if I lock this down now I'm bouncing a lot more does that make sense so what we'll do guys is we'll play with that a little bit so the first thing I want to have you do um, is basically just try out that grip. So we're gonna just dry fire a little bit, have you guys adjust your grip, um, and then we'll go from there shooting. Okay, so this drill is really, really simple, okay? We talked about grip and how grip is your first sight picture, but I put these little red dots on here because I found even for me, I'm not specific enough with my eyes. Even in USPSA as I'm shooting competition, if I, like, it's crazy how much once you get synced in with the gun, how your ability to look somewhere will just make the gun go there, okay? Um, so this is gonna be a very, very visual like drill as we get started. Um, so I really want, when you start, I want you to be burning a hole, like that's where your focus, where your eyes should be. The theory behind what we're gonna work here is whether it's a red dot or a iron sight, right? If I'm looking here and my impacts end up there and I'm bringing the gun to my eye, what also, like what's the missing element that we're solving for that's gonna be there? Our sights. We might not process it, but if I'm looking here and I'm impacting here and I'm bringing that gun up to my eye line, my sights are gonna be there, right? I might just be calling my shot as I'm taking it. Does that make sense? So when we start basically what this is looking to do, we're not, we're not worried about trigger right now. We're literally purely worried about our grip, our looking somewhere, pressing the gun out and just firing, okay? That's the difference of what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a demo for you guys so you can kind of see, but the idea here is the time that it takes us to stall out and send one shot, especially when we're dealing with like a human-sized target versus me just drawing the gun out and as soon as it feels level, I'm able to shoot, 
um, and, and kind of achieve the same accuracy. Does that make sense? Um, so let's go ahead and throw our ears on real quick. Okay, so what I'm gonna do guys, and I'm not gonna push my draw like crazy fast here because the purpose is actually not the draw. Like I'm not trying to show a wicked fast draw. So my draw will kind of be just consistent, comfortable draw. But the difference between these two, um, basically the first one, I'm gonna wait until I see a red dot, until my brain goes, yep, there's a red dot, and then I'm gonna fire, right? Then the next one after that, I'm going to just draw out, and as soon as the gun feels level, maybe I see a dot, maybe I don't, but I'm not gonna wait for it. Does that make sense? And we're just gonna see what the kind of the time difference is between the two, all right? So this is me waiting for that red dot, lining it up. Um, basically anything within the center of the chest, like A zone, I'm, I, is acceptable. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to hit that dot, that's just where my eyes are. Make sense? All right, here we go. All right, so. That was a 138, okay? So that, like, you're watching, and you're like, okay, 138, that's not that crazy. I got pretty damn close to the dot. You know, that's pretty acceptable, 138. Um, doesn't seem like I have a whole lot of time. Didn't look like I was really rushing my draw stroke, right? Just kind of looks smooth and clean. So I'm gonna do that exact same draw stroke, but the difference is that pause. Did you see when the gun came out, I kind of sat there for a second, was like, ah, there's my dot, fire, right? We're gonna get rid of that, and let's see how much time that shaves off for us. Okay, what do you think the time on that one was, guys? One. One second. Okay, how much do you think 0.3, three tenths of a second matters when someone's this close to you? Does it, what's more important here? Do you think being close to this little red dot is more important or is this acceptable? Right, and what's cool about this, if we do it a couple times, you'll see, I'll get a very similar, like my times will be consistent, but I'll start dialing it in as I warm up and my grip and everything feels more normal. These are the first two shots I've had out of my gun in like today at all, right? And so that's a, like a second to shot to a target like that is pretty decent, right? So let's do it again and see if we can repeat the same thing. Right, I actually caught Dot on that. What do you think that time was? Just under one. Nine eight, right? So it might look like this is I'm not going wicked fast. I'm really not. I'm not like trying to get the gun out there quick. I'm just like, as soon as the gun's level, I know my grip feels good. Now I'm able to push it. The thing I want you guys to think about, this sounds kind of weird. It's not slow down or anything. It says only draw as fast as your grip is good. Does that make sense? So like, don't be slow on your draw, but if you're compromising your grip to get a faster draw, starts not being really worth it because that's where we'll start seeing rounds go like over the head, right? So if I do a compromised draw, I could send one over the shoulders and I also don't have accountability. My dot's not gonna return. This one, 0.98, I shot and saw my dot at the exact same time. I was like, boom, oh yeah, my dot's nice and center, right? I'm just not, for this, I don't need to wait. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. You guys ready to try it? So the drill you guys are gonna do is you're basically gonna start from your chest, finger off the trigger, you're just gonna nice and relax, present, and as soon as that gun feels level, as soon as it feels like it comes to a stop, do not wait. Just, I don't care if you hit deltas or whatever, it needs to feel a little uncomfortable. Guys, this is what you're going to do if someone's right in front of you, right? Whether you like it or not, you're gonna fire, right? So we wanna start to train that. We wanna teach your brain like, hey, you can be pretty accurate at this distance if your grip is squared away and you're being specific with your eyes. What do our eyes tend to do? Look at threats, right? So this kind of starts to work into that like, oh, this might be beneficial because I'm gonna be focusing on that thing that's attacking me, right? You wanna try it? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Yeah, it's on you guys. Um, so did everybody get the thing about you can speed up on your presentation with your arms, but then kind of smooth at the end? Yeah. So some of the thought process behind that is if your arms are like super locked out and you just jam them out there, you're going to induce like a lot of uh, a lot of kind of negative pressure. Your your side picture is going to bounce around more because you have too much. Uh, you're too tense, basically. So think of it like kind of like at a suspension bridge, how they have loose tolerances, right? So they can move and flex a little bit. It's kind of like that so that you can go super fast on just getting it out to where you need to have it, but then you just kind of slow down so that each little micro kind of movement slows down a little bit and it's easier to pick up the front sight. Same thing with your trigger press, as you guys probably know, that if you're super tense on that, all the issues that you have are just magnified. That's why you relax. It's kind of the same principle. Okay, so drawing from concealment's really, every draw is kind of the same. So like, 
once you guys learn how to draw from concealment, you're gonna kind of understand how to draw from a holster. Like it's not anything super, super crazy. Um, what I'll do is I'll clear out my gun real quick. Okay, so the first and biggest issue with concealed carry and drawing that makes it different, what do you guys think? Garment. Exactly. So the garment is this whole thing that constantly changes on us, right? Yeah. So what's happening right now with the seasons? It's changing, right? It's getting a little colder out. Who started maybe wearing a little bit of a sweater or wearing something that was up in the closet for a long time, right? Yeah. All of that stuff is going to affect um, the way that we draw our gun, okay? Now, ideally, here's the reality of it. Ideally, in a concealed carry situation, I want the draw to be of like no factor. I want to set myself up to where it's like I can literally be like, cool, now I'm ready to go. But the reality is that's probably not going to be the case, right? So we want to have a good, efficient draw, right? We want to be able to draw. And like I said earlier, you should only draw the gun as fast as you can get a good grip on the gun, right? Because if you go all fast and throw the gun, like... That's not good, right? If you have a crappy grip on it and all of a sudden someone gets close to you and now you're trying to fight someone off of a gun with a crappy grip, like you should not draw your gun if you don't have a good grip on it, right? That just shouldn't be in your brain. That doesn't mean your grip's gonna be perfect or that you should stop if you go to draw and your grip's not perfect, but it means in training, we should hold ourselves to a very high standard because I just proved to you the value of it, right? I just showed you like, hey, that's probably what you're gonna be doing. If you, if you get into a shooting tomorrow, you're probably gonna be doing something like that, right? So. Guys, the first thing with clearing garment, whether you're going from four o'clock or appendix, all right? I'm gonna talk appendix first, then I'll kind of add some notes for the, the four o'clock position as well. So when I go to draw appendix, there's a couple different ways you can do this. Everyone's different. They have their preferences. Um, some people will reach down here and they'll grab and they'll pull up, okay? There's a couple reasons why I don't prefer to do this. One of the biggest ones is as garments change, this starts to not work as well. If I have a shirt that comes down below my butt and it like kind of hooks on my butt as I'm trying to pull up and I pull out, like this can get really tough to clear. If I'm wearing a bunch of jackets, this doesn't work as well, right? So what I prefer with, my, with this hand is I prefer getting just right above the gun and just bunching up whatever clothing I have and basically ripping it straight up. That's, I just like to just straight up and out of the way. The other thing that I'll do, um, is sometimes if I'm catching my garment when I'm gonna draw, if I'm wearing a long shirt, is not only will I grab it here, but I'll actually rotate my hand to roll up more of the shirt, right? So a lot of times people will do this and you see them kind of like lean back, and not what we wanna do, right? So we get that garment up and we can roll it. It really takes like the difference between, look where my garment's at now, that's in danger of me scooping my garment up versus me rolling it. It takes another like inch out of the way, right? And it's, that's what our hand's gonna do when we grip the gun anyway. Does that make sense? So I'm not a stickler for clearing a garment. At the end of the day, if you get it out of the way and you get to the gun, that's what we're looking to do, right? I'm just sharing with you like what I found over the years of drawing and what I like to do, right? So if you're somebody that's gotten in the habit of doing this, totally fine. Just know the pros and cons of it. That's, that's all I'm worried about. Um, the, uh, the biggest thing is we wanna get that garment out of the way and that is the first thing that can happen. Like we can't get to our gun until that shirt is out of the way. So that can be done very rapidly, right? That's something that it's kind of a, people freak out when you use the term gross motor skill, but it's kind of a gross motor skill. It's a high percentage thing that doesn't take a lot of training for us to think about, right? Just get the garment out of the way, get the shirt out of the way, okay? So that's the first thing. Once we get that out of the way, however we choose to do that, we obviously need to establish a very good grip on our firearm, okay? Now, I'm going to talk about this from also a martial arts jujitsu standpoint of fighting with someone right in front of you. Not like, oh, fighting, but just the idea of balance and wanting to be in a good position in case somebody um, is attacking us, okay? I will see a lot of people when they do their concealed carry draw, because they're trying to get this thumb in, that do this lean back. This is not a good thing to do if we're walking backwards and retreating. This is how we end up on our ass, okay? <laughs> So that is one thing that I was thinking about as we do more stand up and backing away from people and doing all that stuff in jujitsu. Started thinking about going for a gun and doing this is a really bad idea. I don't like this, okay? So if you're gonna use that thumb behind the gun, right? Just dive that thing in there, stay forward and don't do that, right? Here's what I do. I will just reach down and I will grab my thumb over the top of whatever I can get there, right? Because this is a pretty big area that I can grab and hit. Okay, so even if I get a little bit low, but that thumb is high up and I go to draw the gun, I rotate that thumb in and I can make my grip wherever I end up gripping that. Does that make sense? So I like this style of grip better because I can be forward, I could be fighting someone off and be drawing, and I'm just going for a big area on the gun. Does that make sense? Um, I don't know, you know, I can get sub-second from concealed carry, I'm happy. If I'm drawing and shooting around a second, that's pretty 
pretty damn good, right? Um, so grab here, that's gonna be where we index, all right? Um, you also won't tear yourself up ripping you know, with your thumbnail constantly digging in there over and over and over and over again. But the biggest thing is we don't want our posture to go like this, right? We don't wanna have to open that up in order to get there. Does that make sense? Um, so guys, obviously, I start generally with hands up here, okay? So if I'm in a self-defense situation, we talk about sucker punches and getting hit and all that stuff. We do ideally wanna be out of range, but I like having a good just kind of relaxed hand stance up here because my hands are quicker to defend myself if someone decides to sucker punch me. I'm 50% of the way there. You don't have to be an MMA fighter to figure out hands in front of my face is gonna be a lot better than my hands here as I get hit in the face, right? You don't have to be a ninja to just go, oh, okay, I don't wanna get hit in the face, right? That's natural. Um, not only that, but my hands are closer to being able to do this like rotational draw like thing. So it feels better for me to have my hands up here. Doesn't mean not to practice down here, but you just have to remember where are the place that my hands need to go as I draw, right? I need to get this hand here first, then this hand here. So if I'm coming up, I need to make sure I have that cycle down. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's kind of the first thing, however you guys clear garment, I'm gonna let you guys work this because this is gonna take some time for you to build a good grip. As we do this drill, you'll notice when your grip is jacked up, you're gonna see a deviation of where your rounds hit and it'll, this will really start to click. So as I go to draw, I clear my garment, I get this hand out of the way, I get that grip, elbow retracts and gets this basically cleared of my holster, then it's up to the shoulder to basically rotate, right? So as that clears the garment, that shoulder starts to rotate, this hand hops on board when it's most advantageous, not out here, because I don't want to shoot myself in the hand or something. So this hand hops on board, I press out and I bring the gun to my eye line. Does that make sense? So I'll do it nice and slow motion. I clear garment, hand dives in, I rotate into my grip and I press out. You guys see the difference between shoulder and elbow movement, right? The, the elbow kind of clears and then the shoulder rotates and pushes. Make sense? Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'll let you guys dry fire this for a little bit just to get you know a couple reps in so you're feeling comfortable, we can watch you. And then we'll go to live fire and doing it actually on the targets like we did. So um, yeah, sound good? Any questions? No. Draw is kind of one of those things, you just gotta do it. Like I could sit here and explain the crap out of it, but you just gotta kind of practice it. Good, okay, so that was a 171, right? And this is similar to the drill I did a second ago, but you guys can see that little bit of pause, right? He's having to, in his brain, it takes about a 10th of a second to two tenths of a second to make a decision. So he's having to decide like, is my dot there? Oh yes, it's there, right? And so there's that little bit of pause. Now Ryan, what I want you to do is just don't wait, like same presentation and everything, just don't wait. Pick a specific spot on the target. As Soon as the gun feels level, fire. And then what you'll probably be able to do is tell us whether or not you picked up and could call that shot while it was happening and we'll see what the time is. All right. All right, you ready? Yep. Stand by. Good. So you could probably feel that shot a little bit low, right? Yep. Oh yeah. But you're totally capable of calling. Yeah, I'll add on that first shot that you told me to see the sight. So when I came up, I aimed, and then it took me probably that extra half a second to realize my dot is exactly where I was looking anyways. Yep. So it's like, it could have been a faster shot if I wasn't just trying to process like, is it there, is it not there? Yeah, it is there. It's where I was looking anyways, so. All right guys, so this section's gonna all be about trigger control. Um, this is why, I guess it's probably why we start with the grip and everything, because if your grip is really bad, the trigger control's gonna be bad too because of your grip. Um, so there's a reason we keep, when we are aiming out, there's a reason we keep this, again, your primary hand, your shooting hand, your fire control hand, whatever you wanna call it. There's a reason we keep this one a little bit relaxed because if this is really, really tense, we're really gripping it, you're gonna tense up your finger here and you're gonna end up kind of slapping the trigger. So it's it's easier to have a more relaxed grip with this hand, still firm, like Garrett said, you're riding the bike, you're not death gripping it, it's relaxed, and that allows you to more smoothly pull the trigger finger instead of just snapping it and everything. When we're okay with where our gun's pointed with our sight picture and everything, finger on the trigger, we're gonna remove the slack, right? And then we're gonna gradually press once we feel that wall. Are you guys familiar with what the wall is on the trigger? Yeah. Everybody knows what I'm talking about? Okay, so yeah, we wanna come out, what's called prep the trigger, find the wall, and then slowly squeeze all the way through until the gun goes off. Um, from that point, we don't want to, we don't wanna get in the habit of penning the trigger all the way back, so it'd be easier if I just unload this. So, this trigger doesn't have a lot of slack in it, but my slack's right there, that's my wall. So when I press it, bang, gun goes off. We don't want to continue just to hold the trigger. We want to immediately, as soon as we start feeling the recoil and everything, we want to immediately find 
where that click is right there and rest right there at the wall, ideally. So at first, if you have to come all the way off, um, if you're kind of not as familiar with where the reset point in your trigger is, that's totally fine if you need to back all the way off at first, but we want to try to get to the point where we're firing. As soon as the gun recoils, we feel the back of the trigger and then we're immediately coming back forward, right back to that reset point. So again, I don't want the slack totally out, uh, or I do want the slack totally out. I don't want to reset it totally forward. Again, this trigger, literally, the that's the amount of slack in it, so it's a little bit harder to demonstrate. But. Most of you guys are going to default to either jerking the trigger once you get to the wall or squeezing it, right? And so what he's saying, right, this, this stock Glock trigger has a little bit more of a better demonstration, right, is most triggers have mush in them. I mean, you have a nice M&P trigger. You, I think yours is a stock, stock Glock trigger. Yeah. Yours is relatively stock. So you just want to start to feel as we dry fire this, you want to just get this mush out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. The reality is when we're shooting close like this, you're probably going to slap your trigger a little bit. But if your grip is squared away, it's not going to matter as much, right? Um, but when we get back further and we're shooting at lower percentage things, you're going to find this very useful to you hitting, getting that first round impact. Because all we're doing, guys, is we're closing that window off where we're mentally aware of the gun going off, right? I'm taking what could be a random guess at like, I slap the trigger and the gun goes off. That, that makes it hard for me to time when to control recoil. But if I know right when that gun's gonna go off, right? I can press and, and control recoil. It's subconscious, it starts to happen for us, all right? So the drill that we're gonna work is we're gonna put a dot up there and we're basically just gonna say, slack out, are your sights where you want them? Deliberate press. Slack out, are your sights where you want them? Deliberate press, make sense? If I see you jerking the trigger, I'm gonna make you go slack out, slow, steady, painful, awful squeeze. And it's gonna show you the flip side of that cookie. If I see you jerking the trigger, that's what I'll do. If I see you squeezing the trigger, being too cautious, I'm gonna be like, all right, dude, grip it. Like, just hit that trigger, go, right? Okay, slack out, sights are good, press. And I'll make you kind of jerk that trigger. What will end up happening is you'll find a middle ground that's a deliberate press, right? Not too much effort, not too little effort, okay? All right, so what we'll do, I'll demo this real quick and then you guys can load up ammunition, but I want to show you the practicality of this because um, this is usually where people are like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. So, um, absolutely. Does finger placement matter at all? Not as much. It's, it's kind of personal preference. I know some people that hook it way the heck in. Uh -huh. The biggest thing is when you're new, you have to be careful. If you hook it all the way in, you can start inducing a roll to just slightly to the left. So I personally like having kind of my fingertip on there because I'm very sensitive and aware of when I'm taking the slack out. Does that make sense? So just play with it a little bit. If you see yourself drifting off just a hair to the left, it's probably because you're too deep in there and at the very last second, you're kind of curling and pressing that shot off to the left. But I mean, it will be like very small. Does that make sense? Okay, let's throw ears on real quick and I'll show you kind of a practical exercise for this. You got ears good. All right. All right, so I want you guys to kind of stand right here. I'm gonna just shoot this, this little dot, but I want you guys to watch what I'm doing with my trigger, all right? So, I take my slack out of my trigger, right? I'm on the wall. I see my sights where I want them to be. I get a nice deliberate press, right? And then I relax my finger and I try and get back as close to that wall as I can, right? Right now, today, the biggest thing we don't wanna see is you just pinning that trigger to the rear. Because what happens with this, guys, is if I pin that trigger to the rear, right? I see my sight picture, everything's good, slacks out, sights where I want, I press, I pin that trigger. Guess what? My dot is back there. I could be shooting. Why can't I shoot? It's pinned to the rear. I have to do that and let that click. Most people will start reacting to that click rather than their sight picture. So if I if I get in the habit of just basically slack out, sights good. Does that make sense? I can generate accuracy quickly. And that's what I'm looking for. You might have one drift a little left or drift a little right. But as you get better at that rhythm, basically it's just you watch the bouncing ball. As soon as that bouncing ball falls back to where, that slack is already out of the trigger and you're pressing, okay? Think about it like a bow and arrow. I don't shoot a bow and arrow like this. I bring a bow and arrow back and then I aim and I fire, right? So I'll say it with you as we start. We're dry fired a little bit, slack out, sights, press. We're gonna watch what your gun does um, and then we'll go from there. Sound good? Makes sense to everybody? That's not rocket science, crazy. Easy way to shoot a gun. They're not hard. But we spend a lot of time in our vehicles, right? Hence the reason I have a bunch of trash lying in my vehicle. So disregard the condition of my truck. But we spend so much time in our vehicles, there's some little things that are really, really important. First of all, the first thing to remember about this, this is a weapon. Like if you can drive away from something or get out of a situation, like go to this thing first. It's by far a much better option than trying to draw and shoot through windshields and shoot through glass and all that stuff, right? So one rule of thumb that I like when I'm driving a vehicle that I think applies very well to concealed carry is I want to see the bottom of everybody's tires. If I'm pulling up behind a vehicle, I want to be able to see at least the bottom of their tires. Why do you think that is? Because that way you can swerve. 100%. Yeah. Most turning radiuses, you will be able to see. If you see that bottom of their tire, 
and you crank it hard left or crank it hard right, you're not gonna rear end them and it's gonna allow you the ability to maneuver out of that position, right? Um, I'm sure Ryan, when he talks, he'll have a bunch of like vehicle stuff. He's done a lot more being a police officer than I have as far as like, I drove big trucks in Iraq. So it, he's gonna know more driving wise. Um, but that's a really good one for me. Obviously always locking our doors. That's not rocket science. But um, you know, keeping in mind that this is a pretty sealed off container, it takes a lot to get through this. Really the only thing I'm worried about is if someone's pointing a gun at me. Like a bat doesn't really scare me because it's like, all right, you're gonna have to take one big swing, knock my window out and then get to me, right? You're not just gonna like do those at the same time. So um, yeah, so that food for thought, right? Your vehicle is a, it's a giant 7,000 pound thing that you are in, okay? Um, all right, so let's talk about some of the details of actually drawing from concealment though. So come nice and close guys, I wanna show you this. This is kind of a cool trick um, and it, it's worth practicing, right? So most of the time, you know, we have our seatbelt on, right? And I've mentioned if I'm going for a longer drive, sometimes I'll put my, my gun in here. But if I'm going somewhere short or whatever, I'm in the city, I'm somewhere where I'm like, ah, I'd really like to have my gun on me just in case. Um, and I have to draw from concealment. This is kind of nice because this goes into what we just learned about drawing from concealment, all right? One of the big problems we have is if I just clear this shirt, you know, like I pull it out of the way and I get to here, the gun is still covered by this little strap going across my yeah. thing right there, right? And so a lot of people, you know, they're like pulled out of the way, then like fish for their garment. One of the easiest ways to do this is when you grab your shirt, same position that you grab it, you pull, and what does that do to that strap? Pulls it out of the way, right? So now I can draw and get to my gun. Guess what I'm immediately going to do in a vehicle? Flag my legs. <laughs> um, so flagging yourself in a vehicle is a reality. This is one of the few places I do like temple index. Okay, inside of a vehicle, if you're crawling over people and doing stuff, I think it's a beneficial position. It doesn't have to be pressed up against your temple, but it's much safer to keep the gun pointed up here. As soon as the gun goes down like this, you're flagging people's legs left and right, okay? So I think it's a very good thing to, like, if you're moving in a vehicle, you have to crawl across, it's not a bad place to put the gun up and aim temple index. Does that make sense? Um, it's one of the few places I think it's really solid. I think it's kind of silly when we start running around outside, but um, I like it for this because, you know, if you start having to do stuff where, you know, you draw the gun, you're like, boom, 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 and you're getting out of the vehicle. If you don't get this gun up, it will go everywhere. I mean, you just crawl around and you like park your car in your garage one time and practice crawling from driver to passenger. And if you don't do this, you'll be like all over the place, right? Vehicles are weird that way. Um, so you'll, you'll spend some time flagging. So when you get in your vehicle, guys, just get, you know, get accustomed to doing that draw stroke where it's like, I can grab here, pull, and I just might have to rip a little bit, but it clears me up to get it out of there. It's never really pretty. If you can think about setting your seatbelt to where this shirt's not trapped by it, you're better off. Yeah, if you can undo this shirt, obviously that's gonna help you get you ahead of the curve, but really being able to grab, pull, which pulls this out of the way and allows me to get to that, the grip, okay? All right, the last kind of semi-controversial thing that the internet's probably gonna lose their mind if I talk about it. Shooting through a windshield, okay? This is, a heck of an issue that people freak out about, okay? Um, I'll just say it, I've never shot someone through a windshield, okay? I, so if that's your metric for what, hey, do it or don't do it, I've never shot someone through a windshield. I don't, you know, I can't tell you for a fact this works. I have shot through a windshield and, you know, targets to see the shift, okay? For me, if I'm, let's just paint a scenario of what Garrett the civilian might run into. I'm driving around, a car stops straight, stops short in front of me, I slam on my brakes individuals hop out of that vehicle and they have guns. I am now so close to their vehicle that I cannot pull forward because they stop short and there's a vehicle behind me, so I can't really back up. First thing I'm gonna do is if I see guns in their hands, I'm probably gonna slam as hard as I can into the back of that vehicle, yeah. trying to get it out of the way because that'll, most people will move because of that, you know, even if I'm not gonna go far, right? From that point, if I see guns starting to point into the cabin of my, gun, my car, right, and I, you know, I'm going to try and get bullets going back as soon as I can. If that means I'm shooting through a windshield, cool. I'm shooting through a windshield. The reason is, what tends to change the way bad guys behave in a gunfight? When bullets start coming out. When it's a two-way street. Do you think that, let's just put ourselves in the bad guy's shoes, okay? I'm walking up on a vehicle, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to come up on that vehicle, and I'm gonna try and carjack that person, right? And all of a sudden, a loud noise and spewing of glass and something starts coming back towards me. How many people are you gonna be like, oh, don't worry, man, he's shooting through a windshield? I wouldn't, I'd be like, holy, he's shooting back, right? That, now, here's the rabbit hole. Passive is always an option. If you wanna see, if they're gonna just hop in your car and take it and you wanna go the passive route, 
might be an option. You might be caught off so far off guard that it's a for sure thing they're gonna shoot you if you draw on them, okay? Guys, it's dynamic. So when people say, this is the way, this is the gospel, I don't know, right? Um, I do know for a fact that it is not preferable to shoot through your windshield. Like if I don't have to, I'm not looking for a reason to shoot through my windshield. I would, as a civilian, way rather just drive away, right? But I do know that the only thing that's probably gonna affect that person who's got a gun and is about to shoot into my static ass position is probably bullets going back. There's always the option, engine block. You can get behind the engine block. You know, there's a lot of things you can do. I don't tend to think of this as a do or do not. I think of this as a, what's the situation? What, what are my options? What do I have to do? You know, um, you got kids in the car, right? Pass, what, you know, what do you do? How do you handle that situation? I don't know, that's tough, right? Because me shooting back could turn, tell them to turn tail and run away. That could be an option. Or it could make them start shooting into the car, right? How do you know that? There's no answer to that. No, no amount of person that's been in gunfights can predict human behavior, right? No one's a mind reader, okay? So if, let's just put it this way, if we decide that we're in a situation where we think, you know what, shooting through a windshield's a good idea. Here's the way you wanna do it, okay? So once we get our gun out, right, and we see what's happening, I don't wanna stand back here and shoot through a windshield, okay? The reason being is, as I traverse, let's say that person starts to run, I'm gonna have to punch a new hole each time, right? Hollow points will take more rounds to get through that windshield. But if you press that muzzle right up to that glass, not only are you getting the hollow point, but you're also getting the muzzle blast pushing through that glass, okay? So as you press up to the window and you get it nice and close and you start to fire, the other thing is I don't want to have to punch new holes through the windshield if I can't, if I don't need to, right? Because it's going to take maybe a round or two for it to repenetrate. And every one of those rounds that hits glass is going to be shifted, right? Um, when you're shooting out here, what you think the way to think about it is if this is my bullet right and it's traveling what's going to hit first the top, side. the top side right and so what's that going to cause it to do if the top is slowing down it's actually the opposite if the top is slowing down think about something that's hitting water right if it's dragging what's going to happen is it hits the water it's going to shift downward so as this one is hitting the water up top it's actually going to snag that and send it up make sense kind of counterintuitive um, the way that I think about it is if you're shooting out of a car, it's going to the sky. If you're shooting into the car, it's going to down, down to the floor, right? That's a good way to yes, it. simple, but good way to put it. Um, so again, guys, at five yards, we're talking about like the first one, you might see shift like yay, yay much. If you get a chance to go to a class and shoot through a windshield, it's good. You know, if you, or if your windshield's bad and you want to bring it to an outdoor range at a buddy's place, it's a good thing to, to see what it does. There's tons of YouTube videos on it. The shift is like, if you're shooting someone at your hood, just aim at their pelvis. You'll probably be good to go, right? Yeah. Um, so as I do that, I'm going to press out, try and get right up against the glass. And if there's traversing to be done, I'm going to attempt, again, I'm going to attempt to rotate my body, not the muzzle, because that means I'm going to keep that port. Even if I'm nicking the side of it, like I've made a firing port through the center of my windshield. Make sense? Now, complex, very difficult. A lot of stuff to think about under stress, right? I get why people say never shoot through a windshield. To me, I'm not going to say never in that situation. Um, because if I don't shoot through the windshield, let's just put it this way. Someone's aiming a gun at me. I'm freaking dead. Like yeah. if I'm getting out of the car, the best, the best bet at that point would be get down, take cover, like open your door, try and crawl out. And honestly, a lot of these situations, passive, if they're just going for the car, passive might be the better option, yeah. mm -hmm. right? I'm not a mind reader. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Fair enough. Definitely. Okay, cool. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to show you guys, you know, navigating your car, working around that stuff. Um, which way do you think it's better to use a vehicle as a piece of cover? Like long ways or sideways? Does that make sense? So would I be better? Long ways, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So this is a lot thinner. There's a lot of like a lot less to go through, right? I have a door. I maybe have like a center console glass. Like this is a lot. You, you would rather put more and stack stuff in between you. So if I can get to the front of the vehicle, now I'm stacking um, like multiple panes of glass and angled glass. I'm stacking an engine block. I'm stacking like multiple things in the way of what my threat is, right? So just logically speaking, this is the better way to work around a vehicle. It's not like you're gonna be like, hey dude, like go over there. I wanna work the long axis of the vehicle. We don't really get to choose that stuff. But if we kind of look up at it, it's like, hey, what's a good way to approach this? maybe it's a good way to come to the front of the vehicle first and start using that good piece of cover. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say, which is kind of like a, a thing, mobility. People that fall over and lay on their backs on vehicles and do all that stuff, like 
No, just don't. Um, I mean, if you have to, you have to. Knowing how to shoot from alternate positions, fine. Um, if someone's way the heck over there and you, it's an active shooter and you're like, oh my God, they're shooting over the hood. Maybe I need to lay down and take, maybe. But the amount of times that I'm gonna give up mobility to lay down on my back and shoot under a car, if there's someone right there, the odds are if I go down, most people play ring around the rosy. Like you can watch plenty of videos of people chasing around each other around the car like that. So if I drop down and go to try and shoot someone under a car, what's probably gonna happen is his feet were here by the time I hit my back, he's gonna be here and I'm gonna be like, oh God. So, I mean, I, I'm a very hard on saying, like I won't say never, but there is not really a good reason to fall over on your back and shoot underneath a vehicle, especially if someone's like pretty close. Does that make sense? Yeah. Fair? Um, so you'll see instructors doing some of that stuff where it's like putting their feet up on the cars, doing all this stuff, you know, maybe, but again, I tend to think being accurate and just getting rounds on the target of what you're trying to shoot is gonna be a little bit more effective. If you limit your mobility, it's not like nobody's gonna be thinking about that. Like, what, you can shoot under a car? I had no idea. Like, they're probably gonna be like, oh, that's a car. Let's just send rounds at it, right? It's, bullet. it's a bullet trap, right? Something we wanna shoot at. Make sense? Cool, Ryan, you have anything to add? So I'll, I'll touch on a couple things, just kind of general terms for driving. Um, a lot of criminals, they see the vehicle as a window of opportunity, obviously. I mean, I think as everybody knows here, there's a shit ton of car break-ins in Atlanta every day, and even up here in Cobb County and everything, and uh, uh, all the uh, North Metro areas. Um, one thing carjackers will typically try to do is they will target you while you're in between. So let's say you're parked, you know, wherever you're going, you're turning it off, you're playing on your phone. That's when somebody's gonna come up to your door typically. That or a red light, maybe. Um, this is kind of the, this is something I got used to doing at work and maybe it's a little paranoid, but anytime I pull in a parking lot, I'm already just like seatbelt off. And as soon as I park that car, I'm immediately out. I'm good to go so that I'm not caught in between. Um, that's why they tell a lot of people, you know, to not get robbed while you're going to your car in, uh, at night in a parking lot, have your keys in your hand and stuff, yes. you know, as long as you can get in and out quick, I don't care where you put them, but, um, yeah, you just don't want to spend a whole lot of time here with your car unlocked in a bad position, especially if you, uh, especially if you pull into a spot a lot of the time. So now you have to turn your back away from the entire parking lot to get in the car. I like to back in constantly. That's definitely kind of more of like a police officer thing. Um, but I like that. So one thing with the seatbelt, I picked this up from, I think it was just a YouTube video a long time ago. Um, especially, you know, you got guns and stuff on, um, the seatbelt gets caught on things. I just like to do this. I can put this one hand here, my, my left hand here to stage it. And then all I have to do is pop this button and I can swim out kind of like a rifle sling. And then I'm not like trying to reach over, do all this stuff, getting caught. Um, if you're trying to go really fast, you know, you might you might get caught if you're not careful, but you definitely want to kind of peel peel your arm back away from it to get that thing out of the way. I like what Garrett's saying, where it's like you're boxed in, car in front pulls up, your your uh, your rear is uh, blocked as well, and dudes are starting to shoot at you. I'm totally fine with absolutely just sending some initial rounds because at that point, your best piece of cover is your gun pretty much. From that point on, I, I want to bail out of this vehicle so fast because, I mean, it's like shooting at those paper targets. They're not going anywhere. I'm still in the same seat, you know, so they're just going to aim at the last seen position. So, yeah, I might do some of this. Hopefully, again, hopefully you see something like that coming and you kind of are able to peel out of that seatbelt preemptively, even though it might not, might not be time to bail out of your car yet or whatever. It's just super situation dependent. But, yeah, um, get off the X is something that, most people are familiar with that have a lot of formal training. This is the X, this is where the enemy knows you are, and it's driver's seat in a car. So unless you're out, you're gonna be in that same spot. Um, I guess like super police officer officery stuff is that, you know, you've probably seen people get pulled over before to where the car we're pulling over is facing this way, like the front of their vehicle is pointed this way, right? And then my vehicle is gonna be angled. Whole reason being is that it puts the engine block and the wheel well in a position in between me and the other car as better cover than just this concealment that's like basically tin foil and plastic. <laughs> um, you know, that might not be something you really use a lot, but you can definitely think about it. That's why they tell you when you're kind of first learning how to drive when you're in a turning lane, it's like don't pre-turn your wheel because yeah, if somebody slams into you now you're going straight into the oncoming lane, right? Um, yeah, as far as that goes, uh, the vehicle with cover and everything 
I would definitely suggest taking a good vehicle class, especially if they're going to let you shoot a vehicle and shoot through it and stuff. But I've done it and this was like a four door sedan. The instructor had me shoot the bumper, just a regular bumper here. The round traveled all the way through and came out the back bumper with the regular force. The round wasn't really displaced at all. I mean, it just went straight in and out. So yes, this is better because there's more stuff, you know, maybe depending on stuff you have in your car, what kind of car it is and everything, your odds are better, but, but they ain't great odds. don't, yeah, don't count on it. <laughs> yeah, not like the movies. Definitely don't count on it. Yeah. Um, it's on like the staging gun thing. Honestly, as long as it's something that you're aware of and you know, if you need to get to your gun, you're aware of where it is and stuff. I'll be honest, I hop in the car like this all the time because I'm not really thinking about my gun. I throw my gun on, I'm going to Kroger, I'm gonna go buy steak and beer. I'm not thinking about shooting through my windshield too much. Um, if I'm in the car for a while, I'll tend to just kind of do this. I don't like the seat belt behind the gun. I will kind of stage my shirt over it like this. So it's a little bit more of like an open carry thing. And then the seat belt's here out of the way. So if I have the seat belt on and I need to draw, cause for some reason I haven't done my normal thing, I can at least still get it here. And I know my seat belt's not anywhere near me in my way, but yeah, I definitely like to be able to have this. We were driving at night one time, um, somewhere over in Marietta and it was us and one other car on the road. The car in front of us about, I'd say maybe about 20 yards up, was doing some weird stuff. It was two lanes, they were in front of us, they shift lanes and then stopped. So basically what that means, if I kept going, I'd end up next to them. Okay. And I'm like, no, hell no, I don't even wanna pass this car. So I slam on my brakes and I'm just waiting. And they start to go and I'm like, no, no, no. So I go ahead, I do this stuff with my shirt, I take my seatbelt off and, uh, eventually got to the point where there was a couple cars coming up behind us and stopping because i'm like i'm not passing that car i don't know what they're gonna do <laughs> uh they're stopped you know i have no idea so we ended up kind of inching up towards like the next intersection to where they were stopped behind one car i waited for that light to turn green and i just floored it all the way through and just got out of there <laughs> you know i'm maybe they were having a medical emergency or something you know but i it was night i can't see that's all the data i had i'm not messing with it yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's unfortunate, you know, if that was the case, but yeah, there's just no way um, car stopping the road. I'm going to drive up next to it like that. Common sense. Man. Yeah. A lot of common sense goes that way.